report on this. It'll go into a file folder on the documents. And then it'll, uh, then I go alive on Facebook. Yeah, now that is really that's a little bit to find you, right? Uh, I think so. Like we, if we do it on the church site and you guys do it, you get a pretty good audience. You know, there'll be people who check it out and be like, oh, what's this about? And things like that. My so go to Facebook and our website and Facebook. That's a pretty easy find. Yeah. And then you might want to change it to Thursday study or Thursday yeah, Isaiah. And I'm going to do first John. Yeah. That's what I'm doing. Um, yeah, and then, um, but, uh, and then I will normally, if I don't do, if I do share on the page, then it needs to go to somebody's page that's connected to the uh, the church Facebook. Because I have this option in my personal Facebook account because I'm connected to the church. And so somebody like myself or Janet or Greg need to be connected. You can also do it to, um, as I said, through Zoom to, but we can even record it. You can have the recording. We get the recording. We can upload it um, the next day or the next week. So there's options to do that. Oh, you would want to share it to my personal. Yeah, I mean, now that's up to you. But that makes sense. Um, if you have friends, the church. I, I would think so to the church. Yeah. Um, so if yeah. so, right. So this is. Um, so basically, that was the step, but I had to select specifically this church page. So that was the part that. You mean yeah, Wednesday night? Yeah, Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah. And I, so I put it, you saw I had to type in the information, and then now it's streaming. And then now I'll also be able to later on, I will upload to Facebook. So I usually do the, face, the Facebook live, and then the YouTube, YouTube later will be on um, upload. I haven't figured out how to choose Zoom where it's simultaneously Facebook and YouTube, but there are ways that you can do that. We have confidence you will figure it out. Yeah. But, no, all right. Well, we, we don't want to see different okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. But at the very least, you can record it when you're in Zoom yeah. and then upload it later. And then figure out how to share it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. Thanks again. No problem. Y'all have a good one. So how's Jim doing? All right. All right, good. We're just getting ready for the Isaiah class for the morning. Hi, Joe. Hi, Sandy. Good to see you. Did you like your time? Yeah. Well, good evening, everyone. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm a few minutes uh, behind here. Uh, I had a, I was helping the youth get set up. Uh, Hannah McMahon, our youth director, she's at uh, the general conference with the Emory Candler School of Theology. So she's a seminary student as well, candidate for ministry. So part of her experience with seminary was going to see how the um, machine of a denomination works, um, the political machine. Um, and, uh, I mean, that's kind of, it's based on the U S government, you know, you got three branches, you have a judicial council, you have the general conference, which is a legislative body. And then you have the executive branch, which is called the, uh, a council of bishops. And then over the, uh, under the council of bishops are all of these, um, what you might call the, you know, like we call them cabinet positions or departments. Uh, they call it, a uh, um, you know, connectional or general ministries. So they have, for example, there's a board of discipleship, general board of discipleship. And they have, and then there's a board of communications. And then there's, uh, what else do they have? Um, pension, there's a pension thing. There's a publishing house, uh, you know, um, there's a general board of general global ministries. That's the missionaries part of it um, and global missions. And then, uh, there's probably several more I'm forgetting, but you know, they all make up this general church, right? So just like, you know, the federal government, it, the biggest branch in the federal government, the executive branch, well, in our general church, the biggest branch that implements policies that are decided at general, uh, general conference is the, um, you know, all the general ministries that are overseen by various bishops and annual conferences and so on and so forth. So it, it's a little bit of a top-down approach um, in the United Methodist Church that is can be helpful. Uh, I think that where it works best is in global 
global ministries. I mean, there's a lot of mission that is done that small churches normally could not be a part of, but they can be a part of it because they are a part of a bigger connection. Uh, so that's one advantage. Uh, you get in a sort of a, a scaled up economy of scale. Everybody puts in a little bit and then gets a lot more out of it. Um, uh, that being said, because it's such a big umbrella, you know, there tends to be a lot of, um, you know, as you imagine, disagreements, disputes. Every denomination on earth has them. Um, so there's nothing immune from it. Um, so if you'd like to know more, I, I did a little presentation on General Conference. There's some materials available about it, but we wish Hannah well on that. We've got Bobby Rowe, who's the uh, overseas uh, Lake County's uh, South Lake or North Lake County Fellowship of Christian Athletes. So Fellowship of Christian Athletes is a parachurch organization um, that basically started in colleges to develop small groups for uh, you know, in Bible studies for athletes, but it reaches all college, kinds of college students now and students in the high schools. So a lot of them aren't athletes. Some of them are, um, and there tends to be a focus on their camps on building um, evangelism through uh, intramural sports uh, in the schools and um, around. Uh, similar to something called Young Life does it with the outdoors. So you might have ever heard of Young Life. That's another church, parachurch thing for young people. Um, but we, we uh, Bobby Rose, uh, uh, grown up in the community, so a lot of people know him at the church. So we really are glad to support. And people ask, well, the schools, you know, they don't have prayer in schools anymore. So how can we pray for the schools? Well, supporting FCA is a big way that we can help bring, um, you know, uh, prayer into the schools and God into the schools because as long as it's a club and it's in the and it's optional the students can be a part of it and so Bobby gets the level two clearance builds relationships with the principals the administrators and they're like sure glad to have FCA on campus and um, so that that's how we reach the you know partnering with somebody like Bobby allows us to you know, bring prayer to school and, and know what's going on in schools and uh, have a good influence on our young people in the community. So we're glad that he's with our youth group this evening and the basement. So I was able to get them set up and, uh, you know, so encourage you, thank, appreciate your prayers on that. Uh, we'll go ahead and open with a word of prayer and then we'll go into our study of uh, First John. Oh, I do. I have two extras. Uh, did you all want th these are just one. just one? Yeah. And then I could pass one over. I didn't get that many. So if there was anybody else who needed more, I, I was just, you know, it's not essential, but it's helpful for you at home to maybe review. Uh, we did get to one and a one and half of two last week in first John. Uh, so we'll I'll go ahead and review a little bit of what we did. Uh, as we start. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, I give you thanks for this beautiful evening, uh, for this opportunity to gather together to study your word, uh, to grow in faith, to be in fellowship with one another as he is in the light. Uh, I, I ask all these things in, in Christ's holy name, our Lord and Savior. Amen. All right, so we are in uh, First John. And according to tradition, <clears throat> John, the beloved disciple, uh, Jane, uh, there were James and John, right? Uh, Sons of Thunder. Um, they... Uh, they were um, fishermen, like Peter and Andrew. They would have known each other in Galilee. Well, this this is likely the same John who's writing these letters in older, in I should say, is more senior years, right? That's a nicer way to say it. Uh, and uh, he's, perhaps he's in exile, we don't know, but definitely by the time he writes Revelation, he is in exile in an island called Patmos. 
if he's not in exile when he's writing these, he's writing it in um, to the church in Ephesus. But highly likely that the reason he's writing this is to connect with them in exile. That uh, these these letters of uh, first, second, and third John um, would have been to a similar community as Paul was writing to in Ephesians. So uh, because John was primarily based out of the region of, of Ephesus. Um, there's a church that we were able to visit when we went to Ephesus that uh, the ruins of it, at least, are the traditional burial site for the beloved disciple of John. And it's also believed that uh, Jesus' mother, uh, Mary, likely uh, lived her louder last days in Ephesus. But John fulfilled the vow uh, and the encouragement that Jesus gave on the cross, you know, son, behold your mother, mother, behold your son, you know, to bring them together. And as he took care of his uh, earthly uh, mother uh, in that way, even uh, in his last moments on the cross. Um, <laughs> so we, you know, one of the other things we talked about was the, the contrast between dark and light that was present in the first chapter that continues in the in the second. This is a important metaphor that we we talked a little as we talked about it last week. The the light represents illumination, represents knowledge that comes from another source. Um, it's not necessarily you know, in in mind you, I think using the metaphor of light, it's it's supernatural knowledge. It's spiritual knowledge. So it's not just facts in a book. It is something that comes from God. Uh, you know, in um, let there be light, and there was light on the first day of creation. So that's there's that's we're meant to see that connection. Uh, we can also see that connection in John's gospel. At the beginning uh, was the word, and the word was from from God. So the very first words out of John's gospel are in the beginning. And so John is very organic here. He wants to connect uh, the supernatural world to the physical world, uh, wants to connect our own personal experience to um, a divine experience of what God is doing. Um, so I, I think that, uh, yeah, there's a lot of layers for us to look at. So we got to, I believe, about... Um, verse 15 and so i'm going to kind of pick up from there but the other thing i uh, wanted to go over was when we were starting in chapter two, <laughs> two what i emphasized is you do see some of the same language as you see in the gospel of john and some of the teachings of jesus are mirrored here in the uh the epistles so you might wonder, well, which came first? Was it the was it the gospel or the epistle? And I, I think in some sense the epistles came first and then the, and then the gospels, if I had to guess. Because what we know about the gospels is when people started seeing their friends dying who had known Jesus or at least were, you know, within a six degrees of separation of Jesus they realized we better start writing this down or we're going to forget. Usually writing something down, uh, there's a there's a crisis or there's a sense of urgency. Much like the five books of Moses probably came to be in our present form during the time of exile. Uh, there was, you know, there was likely early precedence for those five books. Um, you know, they are developed from tradition out of Moses. But there was a process that brought them to be. And historically, the best we can you know, guess is that the pressure of exile and then the pressure of mar uh, brought the Hebrew scriptures to be and the pressure of martyrdom brought the gospels to be as they are because they want to make sure we got to capture these stories of Jesus. We can't just tell them around the campfire and reminisce. We better put these down in writing because those of us who remember and saw with our own eyes as it says here in the epistles and then also in the gospels, we're disappearing. So that, um, that creates a sense of urgency. Um, 
<clears throat> so I, I kind of got that summarized that uh, a new commandment to love one another is that as we see that in John um, chapter 15, the gospel of John chapter 15, that same, same kind of theme uh, is in chapter two. Uh, so there's a lot about love and fellowship in here and uh, spiritual knowledge. If you know Christ, if you then you will you know know what true fellowship is. If you know what true fellowship is, then you will know Christ. It's kind of reciprocal. There's a uh, as Jesus even said, "I am the vine; you are the branches." Also in John 15, using that metaphor. So John loves to use metaphors, and um, he also likes to emphasize the metaphors that Jesus used. Some of the gospel writers like to emphasize the parables. John seemed to like to emphasize the private teachings of Jesus uh, that are more metaphorical. And I think some of that is, is to draw people away from the esoteric teachings of Gnostics and other mystery cults that were very popular uh, in the Greco-Roman world and particularly would have been popular in Ephesus. There probably would have been some secret societies and such, um, you know, and Part of the temptation of secret societies is you have to is the treatment of it as works righteousness like you have to have a certain merit or a certain value as a person in order to enter a secret society you aren't just going to let it be let in because you know say hey i want to join you got to go through a rite of initiation and typically you have to be somebody of influence in the community or uh or you got to pay a lot of money like Scientology is a perfect modern example of a Gnostic sort of religion. You 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 know you want to get up a level. Guess what? It's going to be ten thousand dollars. What? Okay. And then they keep what you get somehow. They, it's a con game, right? And there was this kind of religious con game going on even in the the this time in the Greco-Roman world. So that darkness that. John is talking about is he's trying to say, listen, you think that's light. You think that's illumination. You're paying for that. It's deceptive. It's a con game. No, this is the true light. It comes from God. Like the sun comes from God. You know, you, you the sun shines on everyone. And, uh, you know, we can't put a big dome over the earth. Although some people might try to get people to pay for sunlight at some point. I mean, there's a way. So, uh, this is what John's talking about, kind of the context of this. Uh, do not love the world or the things in the world. In verse 15 of chapter 2, the love of the Father is not in those who love the world, for all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, the pride and riches, comes not from the Father, but from the world. And the world and its desire are passing away, but those who do the will of God abide forever. One of John's favorite words, abide, abide in me as I, you know, make your dwelling place with God, your home with God. Uh, children, it is the last hour, as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. From this, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But by going out, they made it plain that none of them belong to us, belongs to us. So the Antichrist is such a loaded word in this day and age that um, I think it's pretty hard to get this sense of what, what John's talking about. I mean, um, you know, if we say it's the Antichrist, you're thinking probably of, a big devilish sort of figure or a beast, you know, the mark of the beast, 666, that accompanies the Antichrist. You might be thinking about Revelation. Uh, you might be thinking that it's whenever somebody doesn't like someone, um, they will call them, oh, that person's the Antichrist, you know, kind of a, a derogatory comment to say somebody's totally evil and we can just totally disregard what they're saying. But an Antichrist is someone who's just against Christ, against his will. So, for example, Peter, the, the apostle Peter, the disciple, at one point was an antichrist. 
And, you know, just after he made that confession, you know, you are, the, you are the Lord, you are the son of the living God. He said, you are the rock, Peter, and upon this rock, I'll build my church. And then Jesus, after that, makes a prediction that uh, he's going to be betrayed into the sand. Son of man must be betrayed in the hands of sinners, to which Peter says, uh, no, Lord, I will never let it happen. And then um, what is Jesus' response to Peter? You all remember this, and this is more in Matthew and Luke's gospel. Well, well, he, yeah, he, you know, in the Passion, that that's almost in all four gospels. Peter denies Jesus three times. Um, that's actually one of those things that's in all four. So we know it's a very genuine story. It's in all four. But he he says, "Get you know, get behind me, Satan." You know, right immediately after Jesus, Peter makes this ultimate confession. So it is, um, we can find ourselves in a position of being an antichrist, antichrist against Christ, even in our own spiritual lives. It, it's not something that you always intentionally do, like, I'm going to set out, and today I'm going to wake up, and I'm going to decide to be the antichrist. I mean, that that there could be that intentional kind of malevolence, but I think what John is talking about here is... Uh, People who are opposing Christ, whether they know it or not. And um, so he's saying, better wake up. Do you want to be an antichrist or not? And, they, and they're like, people are probably saying, as they're reading this letter, no, I, I don't want to be an antichrist. I don't want to be against Jesus. Um, uh, so. And the, the sign of people, uh, you know, not doing the right thing is. Uh, Throughout Scripture, it is it, there's a a, a a fear that okay, this is going to mean judgment. You know, there's a consequence to these actions. Whenever Israel is really disobeying, especially the people in leadership, there's a warning from the prophets, right? And they better change, or some it's you know they're going to have their judgment, uh, recompense for the wicked. So um, this is a prophetic warning in a way. And John sees this, this emergence of people who are opposed to the message of Jesus as uh, indicating a sign of the times. You know? Now, one of the things that we talk about now is, I think you can even see in the, you know, between John's writings, is there, there's a sense, there was probably a sense when he's writing this epistle Jesus is going to come back at any time. But by the time you see read the Gospel of John, and then by the time you read Revelation, when he's much older, you can see a shift in the expectation of when it's going to happen. Uh, something about, one, first of all, that spiritual knowledge, that illumination from God that, you know, you're not going to know the day or the hour, uh, but also that sense of, hey, I've, I've lived a while. It's I was expecting any day now, and he's not come back. Um, I, I can't, I think it's hard for us to imagine because we're a thousand, you know, we're 2,000 years away from the event. But if you're, you were, you know, a decade within the lifetime of Jesus, and you remember that, and he said, I will, leave, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. And then he told prophecies, like, such as that we read about in Matthew's gospel, uh, you know, Matthew 20. Um, 24 and 25 about the signs of the times you're thinking well, he's, he didn't give a day or the hour but it looks like this is it is this it Lord is this it no um, so how would you live with that uh, sense of disappointment expecting Jesus to come back tomorrow and, and he and he didn't how would you what would you I say know that uh... Depending on where it is, it's somewhere in the Gospels, from maybe you know, maybe you know, maybe just one, I don't know. But Jesus supposedly said, This generation should not pass away before I'm coming. Right, and right. Then, and that was what was worrying them because many of them were passing away. Yes. I think that's why they yeah. decided to put it in the writing because they thought it had to last longer than being those who are dying in front of them. But I, I, I can't figure that out. Right, right. There's some mysteries here that we, they don't even understand. Um, 
but let's let's go on and read what they're what they're saying. You know, we could focus easily focus on the bad stuff, the Antichrist, and the warning. But the warning is brought, forced to supposed to prompt us toward turning toward the light. Um, verse twenty. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and all of you have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and you know that no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Everyone who confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If you... If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you will abide in the Son and the Father. And this is what he has promised us, eternal life. I write these things to you concerning those who would deceive you. As for you, the anointing that you receive from him abides in you. So you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie. And just as it is taught to you, abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him so that when he is revealed, we may have confidence and not be put to shame before him at his coming. So, um, so the, you know, there is an encouragement here, rep repetition, uh, anaphora is a literary term for it, um, that about dwelling with God, abiding with God. And, it, and it's, a, it's a, once again, another metaphor for faith. Um, sometimes in the, in, the old, in the Hebrew scriptures, faith, the metaphor for faith is often walking with God. Like Abraham walked with God. Whenever it says that in Genesis, it, it talks about faith as something that's active. Uh, but in the New Testament, it's not as much as walking as it is as much a, a fixed point. Uh, it, you, you're, you're no longer nomads. You know, you have a home with God. At first, you were not a people, but now you are a people. Uh, and this represents the shift from the patriarchs to the Mosaic Covenant, you know, where hero Israel, the Lord your God is one. You know, even before it says the Shema, it also reminds Israel of where they had come from, that your ancestor was a wandering Aramaic. You were nomadic people, but now you, you have a home. Now you, you were once not a people, but now you are a people. And so, may, you know, if you find yourself uh, without a, a spiritual home and you feel lost, you should not feel lost in Christ. So if your, your faith should give you a fixed sense of purpose and a point. Um, the great part about it is, is, you know, a lot of things may change in this world, but faith should be an anchor. Faith should be a home. Uh, and, you know, we need that because it's hard to deal with change in the world, isn't it? You know, so John is encouraging them, hey, no matter what change is going on around you, uh, try to keep your faith because your faith is your anchor in this world. Your faith is your home and uh, home, a place of and sense of home is essential. So the faith is tied to, to having a sense of belonging. Um, and I, I think that's why, you know, the, the, the vision of John that, uh, and especially even continuing from Jesus is that, you know, such as I am the vine and you are the branches. When Jesus taught that to the disciples, he was he was saying that to them, not as you individually only, but you individually as a, a people. And there's something about God, how he's always dealt with us as not just individuals, but as a family of God. Um, so how do you, you know, does that challenge you in any way? I mean, because there's some people who say, well, you know, the church is great, Pastor David, you know, and all, but I can just go out in the woods and have my faith. And I don't, there's nothing I need to practice about my faith in the church. I can just have my Bible, like kind of like Robinson Crusoe. If you've ever read Robinson Crusoe, the vision that Daniel Defoe offers is Robinson Crusoe is on a desert island with his Bible. 
and with his God. And that is the perfect kind of relationship with God and faith. Now, it is in the sense that God provides what he needs, but uh, I think there's a uh, a sense to where um, even in Robinson Crusoe, eventually, oh, wait, I'm kind of lonely here. I need community. <laughs> you know, it meets Friday, and there's a, there's all more to the book than that, but um, we need we need community, and, and a big part of Encourage, growing in the faith is having community. It is that something that will carry us and give and give us a visual representation of that spiritual home. Yeah, I think that uh, it's really John's getting to the heart of that, and so he's saying, you know, if you if you want to get caught off guard by the Antichrist, by all means, and you're going to be more vulnerable if you're not in some type of faith community or house church. Uh, that's a, that's a big, you know. So for for them, church would have looked a lot like what we have right now here around a table, except there would be probably feasting and have some food, right? So those of us who love good good meal, hey, that's great. Church is done around the dining room table in a lot of ways, you know, until it grows too big, <laughs> you know. And then and then there was some potential for. Like you see in the Corinthian community, where the table was used to divide the community, like people got angry if one group of people was always bringing, you know, the, the more expensive meat to the potluck. You know, they felt like it was their potluck, and the people who couldn't bring as much, you know, kind of got to the back of the line, felt shame. So that's that's why the early church probably said, hmm. We need to figure out a better way to represent the community and not use because food can be great, but food can sometimes all become a distraction. And so um, that's why our traditions probably develop over time. So what what do you uh, how do you see, first of all, community as a a play a, a way to enhance your faith? Have you had that experience? Or do you disagree? If you disagree, great. Let's let's talk about it. Sure. Yeah. Well, I think Crusoe had faith on an island, but he couldn't demonstrate that he didn't have a community. Yeah. We have to have a community. Without a community, then we can't have physically express our faith to the community. Uh -huh. It's not just faith, it's also faith and acts. It's not acts alone. It's Base and X without the community. Yeah. We have no you don't have the ability of having the X. Well, that's that's true. Um, and I'm sure John himself valued the community because he was away from it and knew how much he missed it on Patmos. You don't know what you've got till it's gone, right? Sounds like a 80s rock song. Yeah. yeah. But I think the community also helps to build your faith. Yes. No, I was working, I travel a lot and was before everybody who I knew and stuff. And sometimes I'd be gone for weeks and I would feel so disconnected. I mean, I call my family every night, but from my church community and the community helps you when you have problems and physical comfort too. Yeah. It helps you grow spiritually. Yeah. And I would add that um, if you know the creation, that's great. Like Robinson Bruce knew the creation. He knew the Savior, but it's harder to know the third person, the Trinity, the Spirit without community. The Spirit, if you want to see how the Spirit is at work, you look at the community of faith. Um, and sometimes people oppose the Spirit, which is why it deeply grieves God when, you know, <laughs> you grieve the Holy Spirit because it's the it's the shattering of trust. It's the, it's the it's basically going against God's will for uh, not just one person, but for a whole group of people. Um, and uh, and I think that there's some strong language that Jesus uses for people who lead a community astray uh, because of the damage that's done, not just to one person and one soul, but to many, you know, on this earth. So, um yeah. I think that you're fortunate. Your first community is your family. Ooh, okay, that's and, great. Um, yeah, and that's where you get your first taste of faith and understanding 
at what is right and what is wrong. And then that goes into the church and the bigger community. And I say if you're fortunate, because there's a lot of children today who parents haven't, haven't got the faith or haven't shared the faith. And then it's up to the community to embrace them. Yeah. Yeah, the family is our first visible sign of community. Um, and community holds you accountable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, that's... It's one thing to read the Bible and understand it, but when you're in a community of faith, I think you feel accountable to your behavior. Yeah. Interesting. So here, uh, speaking of family, um, the metaphor is going to continue to move toward family from being the home life from the place of, of, of belonging even more toward the actual family so if you perceive that he is righteous you also know that everyone who does right has been born of him ah born into the family so now we've got a process of of a conversion um if you recognize the righteousness of god through jesus christ that is that is the fulcrum of conversion that's the point to where the change happens he's no longer just a good teacher he's no longer just a, a religious leader but he's somebody that you trust that you place your um, life with your faith and trust in him um, and then as a result you're born again and you're born into a new family see what lo the love the father has given us that we should be called children of god and that is what we are so uh, we're in the family of God. The children. The reason the world does not know uh, us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. But what we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And those who have this hope purify themselves just as he is pure. Just as Christ is pure. Um I read this verse quite a bit at funerals. So if you've been to the funerals, I always will slip that verse in there as part of the litur funeral liturgy. But it is a, a call, an encouragement uh, to not only live in the family of God, but to live harmoniously and strive to get better. That our, our spiritual life can be a fixed point like a home, but to make it an even... Uh, Sometimes it can just be a house <laughs> that we're just living in or, or uh, unless we ourselves make it a home. And making it a home means we do play a part and we grow in, in holiness. So this, this purify themselves as Christ is pure is talking about a, a goal, a spiritual goal of living into holiness. Now, this is a word that will get thrown around a lot and it looks like a lot of different things. But it is a goal of the spiritual life, is holiness. So what what does that look like in in the um, in the home life or in the family of God? What does that what does it look like? Holiness look like to you? If you love God, you will live your own mm -hmm. Yeah. Working for that in their life rather than. In the world of like your careers and stuff, that should be secondary and chosen because of your faith and how you can serve your best in life. Yeah, they're, they're, the Apostle Paul talks about it in Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit. That, that, you know, that's the kind of fruit, that's what it looks like to live a holy life to love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self control. You know, I'm probably missing one or two, but. You know, those are those are big indicators. They're like if you've got if you've got that kind of behavior, there is a sense of holiness. And holiness um, isn't just knowing it all in your head, but it is a way that you act in the household of God. You know, so it's not as if I don't know that it's keeping score, um, but if you truly have this hope and you have this faith and it's a lived reality for you, you cannot help but. Uh, try to strive for better things you know if you're saying my home 
is it going to be a heavenly home and it's going to be glorious, I'm sure not going to just want to stay in the trash heap, you know, of the world and just say, you know, this is all there is. So this is what I'm going to live for, you know, fast money, fast cars, you know, whatever else is fast and here today, gone tomorrow. I'm going to live for something else. And I'm going to live for something that's uh, a much higher calling. Um, now, that being said, uh, people, you know, a sort of a put down or at least uh, a, a flip side of holiness, because there can be a flip side to things, is the sense of self-righteousness, not a righteousness imparted by God, but as if we become could become full of ourselves. Like, I got it all together. I'm, I'm really holy and you are not. And that could develop into a superiority complex. Um, so how do you think John, do you think John's message has any of that in there, holier than thou? Or um, what makes this message not uh, an encouragement toward holiness and doing good things instead of being a message about self-righteousness? Right. And the other side is, I'm not worthy. It's God that does it all. You yeah. Can, you do it. Right. So that's, that's, um, you're exactly right, Sandra, that God uses us and that there is a sense of, of needing to depend upon God as the source of holiness. If John is talking about this metaphor of light, light has a source. And for our solar system, it's the sun. And for our spiritual life, it's the son of God. You know, that's our source of light. That's tied together um, in, in John's letters and the gospel. So if you have a source of that, uh, and you're tapped into the source, um, you can't take credit all for yourself. You know? It's coming from somewhere else. Uh, so John then, in an act of humility, reminds us, everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he is revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. So this feels very absolute. You know, what happened? Wait a second. What if I sin? Do Does that mean that I don't know Jesus? What, what do we think is going on here? Or is it there's a contrast made to to say that more of likely if, you know, your connection can wane or it can grow. You know, it's something that must be nurtured. It's that that's why Jesus uses the metaphor of the vine. So I think to me, it's not saying um, that absolutely your whole life, if you sin, that's it. You're not going to know Jesus. It's saying when you're when you're on the right track and you're following God's call, you're living in the fruit of the spirit, then you then you, then you know Christ. And people see that you know Christ. When you're when you're sinning, you don't represent him, you represent yourself. So God can't God, we're not going to give credit for the bad stuff to God. You know, sin, that's not of God. But the things that are good, that are positive, are of God. We're going to give credit where credit is due. And unfortunately, people just lump it all together and say, well, it's all God's fault, right? Mm -hmm. You know, everything, just like, you know, if we, if we live, oftentimes when people lack gratitude or when they're really struggling in life, they usually have psychologically a lot of blame shifting that occurs in their lives they don't really want to take responsibility for some of the things that are going on and i think that when you take responsibility for your own life and your own spiritual actions uh, for the things that you can control uh it's free and the truth will set you free i mean there is a there is Shifting blame and responsibility is one of the ultimate acts of self-deception. I mean, think about it in the Garden of Eden. You had, you know, Eve. Hey, why did you, you know, Adam, God talks to Adam. Adam blames Eve. 
God talks to Eve. Eve blames the serpent. And the serpent's got nobody to blame. It's just like, oh, I don't know. They did it themselves. It's their fault, not me. So there can only come some sense of growth and freedom when we lift off the veil, like the scale fell from Paul's eyes and he realized I and I alone are responsible for changing, for moving toward God, for moving toward the light. There's something powerful about uh, and freeing about saying, I have responsibility. I do have control. In a world where I feel like everybody's telling me what to do uh, and you know, I don't have a lot of freedom, there is freedom in Christ and saying, you know what? This is my decision of faith, and there are things that I can um, change about who I am. Yeah. Um, everyone who commits sin is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Those who have been born of God do not sin because God's seed abides in them. They cannot sin because they have been born of God. The children of God and the children of the devil are revealed in this way. All who do, do not do what is right are not from God, nor are those who do not love a brother or a sister. Yeah. So we could kind of, let's be honest here, uh, be sort of spiritually Jekyll and Hyde. One day you may be really feeling like, I definitely am a child of God. I belong to God. But there, there could be days you wake up and you're not so much a child of God. Now, here's a little bit of a debate here. Some people have this view. Uh, there's a doctrine out there, particularly among holiness churches and Methodist churches called Christian perfection. And John Wesley even used the term Although, you know, there are people who debate what, what that means, Christian perfection. Uh, in the Greek, it means to, um, you know, it, it means perfecting. It's a continuous action that like God is working in us, perfecting us in the verb. So it's, it's not that we're the agent of perfection. Rather, it's what God is doing through us. And so that's where I think it gets misunderstood in the English as a fixed point. And that's what it's been interpreted as, is in the spiritual life, I can reach a point to where my will and God's will are totally aligned and we're in sync. And I'm every day I wake up, I'm a child of God. Now, do you feel like you've met anybody who ever met that, that standard? Because there have been some people who said, I mean, you know, especially in some of the holiness churches, they will write a date in their Bible, the date I was, uh, the date I was baptized, the date I, um, you know, I received the Holy Spirit, and then the day I was perfected, you know, like that, as if this is something that you're going to feel and you're going to say, you know what, I've reached that state of Christian perfection. I'm sanctified. That's it. My spiritual life is done on this earth. And you blow it the next day. And you, you go, <laughs> right. That's my that's my thinking. You know, I, I think, but there, you know, so. I think that we all aim to be. Towards okay. living a life of perfection. I don't know that anyone can actually do that. Maybe Mother Teresa, but yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah, right. Yeah, I, I think that what we often mistake this idea of Christian perfection is with is the sen is something called impeccability. So impeccability means without blemish, without sin. And it clearly in John here, you say he's not ascribing impeccability to the children uh the, the this only one christ the son is the only one that's getting that credit the pure blameless uh the one who's impeccable um but in order to be a part of the family you should want to be like christ you know who is without sin and that's a much better way to live to live in the light so it is a goal it is a striving and i think that um to me, if I were to say, yeah, I think there's a, a point to where people do reach Christian perfection, but it, it's not impeccability. It's not mean that they're going to wake up, like you said, that they're going to mess it all up. If it's about impeccability the next day, they, you know, that they can no longer sin. It's not that, but what it is, is, is they realize their full spiritual potential. You know, and that's what, as somebody's father of young children right now, I talk a lot about 
I want you all to do, to reach your full potential at school. Like, why do you care about our grades? Why, you know, it's like, I know you can do better. Yeah, but it's too hard. It's like, no, I, I, I see your potential. And that's what a lot of it's about. You know, it's like, I don't want you to be done being straight A student, but I want you to try your best to reach your full potential. And there are some people where you could see that, you know, maybe their capacity, their bucket is not as big as others. But they have certainly reached, filled that bucket as full as they could fill it. And they are definitely children and, and, and um, light from God. You know, um, it's not about money. It's not about smarts. It's not about ability, but rather it's about, um, you know, a willingness, obedience, a surrender to, to the will of God in our lives. Thank you. Sanctification then is a work in progress. Like, oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, That's what I'm saying. Yeah. For if a light comes on, it comes on inside you, but not necessarily like one of those Byzantine paintings where it's all holy family stutter. Yeah, halo. Right. Maybe some people can. I'm not one. Right. But but uh, most of us. Well, I I think we misunderstand that that. Uh, medieval or the uh, patristic tradition of having the of hagiography of, of the life of the saints so partly because we're like you know we really we should pray to jesus we don't need to pray to these saints um you know there's something about that got missed along the way but the tradition of the saints early on was to say there are people who god has they've reached their full spiritual potential so let's point them out as examples and tell their test much like and, you know, in modern churches, we want to share a testimony. It's great to share, to hear a spiritual story. That's inspiring. I love to hear, actually, I love to hear your stories. So one of my favorite things in the church is when you all share your story, like in Bible study or something that's happened because, you know, you hear it from Pastor David, you're like, yeah, he's the pastor. He's, you know, been studying in seminary. He's been on this track, but you can teach me even better because you're in the world. Like somebody says to me, uh, like, oh, I've got this world on me and then woo, I need to get it off of me and get into the church and wash it off when I come into the church. And so there's, there may be more temptations that you deal with, uh, you know, outside the church than I deal with having the, the wonderful opportunity to do a lot of things within the church. Of course, I will tell you, the devil, unfortunately, does some of his best work in the church. <laughs> just saying you know deceptively also yeah i mean yeah and, and there's nothing and that's why um so but in any event here i see a lot of wow oh, there's a lot of godly people that inspire me I can look at everybody here and say you know there's something that god's perfected in you that I, I got a lot to learn from you each of you yeah so um so sometimes it's good to give yourself a pat on the back. Sometimes it's good to give yourself a kick in the butt. I don't know what you will want to do this evening spiritually, but my hope is to give you a little bit of a pat on the back because I think I think we get enough kicks kicks in the pants um, every day. The world wants to give us a kick in the pants. And I think that's what John's trying to do is say, you know, you guys in Ephesus are getting caught up with that. Don't get caught up with that here. It's much better. This is a much better place to be. Don't get caught up with that. You know, don't, why do you want to live in the trash heap when you can come in, in, into the home? You know, why do you want to live outdoors when you can live inside here? Um, I told a, I'll kind of close with this. I told a, a story to, as I was going around uh, my last drill weekend about military life. And I, I think it kind of is a good metaphor for this spiritual life and kind of what kind of the same thing uh, John was talking about to the Ephesians. Uh, he, you know, I had a, a, was, I was staying in the barracks at Fort Gordon, Georgia. It was, you know, E4 specialist. You know, some might call that a corporal, but it, in the army they call it most of the time now specialist. And um, uh, you know, I think I was I was actually asleep, and then you know, about close to midnight. Sergeant Major comes through the barracks. And uh, so everybody's called to get up and get out of their room. 
and stand it, you know, stand at attention outside the room. And, uh, you know, he must be looking for something. Somebody's got some contraband or something in the barracks. We don't know why, but, um, but oftentimes the uh, inspection is a time to, to have an account, right? Like, okay, you know, you weren't, you weren't standing on watch, you weren't standing on guard and it kind of promotes that, okay, we always need to be ready because we never know when someone's going to come in the middle of the night. You know, even it's like Jesus says, kind of never know when it's going to come. Let's be ready all the time. So in any event, uh, Sergeant Major comes to my room and says, well, open your wall locker. Okay, I open my wall locker and all my, my gear falls out and then there's sand everywhere. Um, I haven't watched it being in the field. Um, so he uh, dressed me down a little bit, said, you know, this is totally unacceptable, soldier. You know, we keep this stuff like this. You know, uh, I'm going to come back. Uh, I'm going to come back uh, soon and, and check the wall locker out. You better have it cleaned up. Because if, if you if you want to live like this, you can live like this, but you aren't going to live in my barracks like this. If you want to live like this, you're going to live out in, the, uh, out in the field outside the barracks. I will, you can put your pop tent out there, and I will let you sleep out there. If you, if I come back here, it's like this again. So, you know, so it's like he was making me take responsibility. It's like your choice. You you want to sleep inside, or you want to sleep outside. It's your choice. So, you know, I got things together and he came by and he's like, all right, good, uh, you know, special saver. I'm glad to see you got this together. Um, and then the, about, yeah, about a few months later, I got promoted to sergeant. And so he came up to me and said, congratulations, Sergeant Averill. I got some good news for you. Now that you're promoted, you're able to move, you're going to be able to move off post. So go see the the personnel group and they'll get you your um, your orders to move off post. So. So that's a little bit of a parable. It seemed to speak to the soldiers of what, what is possible. You know, when we get find ourselves in difficult times, it's not that we have to stay there. It can be a warning to us, just like John gives a warning to the Ephesians about, you know, there are, and, and for them to take responsibility. They want to live in the house? Let's live in the house. But by all means, live with a certain kind of rules, and, and rules are living for the highest calling uh, that is Christ. And if you do that, you know, you live well in the land, you, you know, you'll be a happy uh, soldier of God, <laughs> you know, so to speak. So that kind of, I don't know, that's my own little story, but it kind of relates to me a lot of what John's saying this evening. So anybody else have anything? Yeah. Some of the testimonies that we can give us in some of our worst situations have been come. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's not where, it's not, definitely the spiritual life, not about where we start. It's about how we finish. You know, that's what life, so, you know, you finish well, definitely, you know, you want your last moments to be your best moments. So whatever we're doing, finish well, run the race, you know, and, uh, you know, yeah. So I, I think that's a big encouragement for us uh, from, from our Lord and from uh, the spirit that has inspired John to speak to us in this day and age, you know, um, all right, well, I'll go ahead and release our online.